Today's episode was brought to you by Scratch. Scratch is an innovative new yarn and craft supply shop located in Lebanon, New Hampshire. They're committed to providing a beautifully curated selection of yarns and supplies for knitters, as well as roving tools and kits for needle felters. Their shop also features embroidery, sewing, and select fine art supplies. Scratch operates with the guiding notion that makers are curious and creative and should be able to find exciting, high-quality materials to work with all in one place. Scratch is also proud to offer Yarn Club, a monthly yarn subscription box that brings you gorgeous hand-dyed yarn in nature-inspired colorways. You can find their full selection of yarns, notions, and supplies on their website at scratchmakerspace.com and on Facebook and Instagram at Scratch Maker Space. Podcast listeners will receive an extra 15% discount with the code 2BROADS. That's T W O B R O A D S. Check them out. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to 2 Broads Talking Politics. As always, I am your host, Sophie, and I'm here with your co host, Kelly. Hey, everybody. And today we have two special guests. We have Jamie and Devin. They both work with nonprofits, and we're going to be talking about nonprofits and volunteering in general. Um, so I'm going to ask you both to um, introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about the nonprofits that you work with. Hi, well, my name is Jamie, uh, and I live in Chicago. So the, the nonprofits that I'll be talking about are based in Chicago. Uh, and I I tend to have a few different interests and therefore I commit to a lot of different things and volunteer with a lot of different things. But I think the ones I'm going to focus on are sort of related in in some sense. Um, So the first one that I spend a lot of time with and really love is called Ravenswood Community Services. And it is an organization that is part, it's it's a, a food depository site. So it works with the Greater Chicago Food Pantry to ensure that people in need receive food pickups every week. And it also provides a community kitchen meal once a week and a biannual fancy meal for people. And everything that happens with the kitchen and the meal is volunteer-based, as is the food pantry deposits. And I believe the staff of RCS actually is maybe three people total. Um, And then the second organization that I'm going to talk about is the um, Chicago Plant Rescue. And the Chicago Plant Rescue is an organization formed by some of my colleagues from college. And we take plants that are being used and tossed out at the end of a growing season and and redistribute them to urban gardens in the city and places that are trying to develop um, more sustainable neighborhood agriculture uh, for agricultural development. Cool. Um, tell us a little bit about how you got involved in um, these groups. Uh, So with RCS, uh, the Ravenswood Community Services, I had a friend who was a, uh, she she worked as a cook on a Tuesday meal. And she invited me to start volunteering because I really love cooking. And that was a few years ago. And eventually we cooked and cooked and cooked so much that we became leads for one of the meals (laughs) Tuesdays. And so we co-lead the third Tuesday of the month, which means that Uh, Using a very small budget, we come up with a menu that's healthy and filling for anywhere between 125 to 135, generally, people every week. Um, And twice a year, we work uh, to put on a really fancy meal that's restaurant style and from a menu. And that's for around 200 people. And so that's that organization is one that I just fell into accidentally and has been something that I really love. Uh, and with the Chicago Plant Rescue, my friend uh, from college, Lindsay Telford, she she was out at a restaurant one day and said to herself, they're just going to throw all these plants away. And that seems like such a waste. And so she contacted me and a couple of other girls that we knew. Uh, and we started this organization and purely off of our own uh, ability to 
pick up plants and move them, we we started reaching out to different restaurants and businesses and um, started collecting plants and then finding community gardens and schools that wanted them. And so it really started small and has actually grown into something quite large and sustainable, which is really nice. That's so cool that you just had this idea and you just put it into motion. Yeah, I think it surprised all of us. Um, I actually was talking to a, a bunch of high school students about this on Friday. And I what I told them was, it's funny because you never think, oh, my idea is going to be one that's going to turn into something. But really all it takes is an idea and a little bit of elbow grease. And if, you, if you're persistent enough, you can usually get it off the ground. That's so cool. Um, Devin, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, the organizations that you're involved in and how you got involved in them? Sure. So my uh, main organization that I've been uh, volunteering with is Sarah Circle. And they're located uh, in Chicago as well, um, on the north side of the city, where I've lived for about 10 years. And I've been involved with them for just about a year. Um, I work as a volunteer helping with their physical donations, um, you know, toiletries and clothing, things like that. And I also serve on their associates board, which is like the junior board made up of young professionals kind of spreading the word and doing volunteer work. But Sarah Circle is unique in that it serves only women and it serves only single women who have no children, um, which is actually a really underserved population in the homeless population as a whole. But in fact, um, they make up approximately 25% of homeless people in Chicago and throughout the country. Um, it's, it's a population that is homeless for many different reasons. And Star Circle kind of works to understand that and help provide services that may they may be able unable to get elsewhere. So um, Star Circle has been around since the late 70s, and they have basically three main components. They have a daytime center, um, which is only open until 4:30 Monday through Friday, and it's basically just a place where women can stop in, get warm or cool take a shower, do laundry, uh, get a meal, and just rest and have a place to be during the day um, so they don't have to be on the streets. Um, there's also lockers where they can store things. And then we give out many of the toiletries and clothing items um, that are donated. So we're providing services in that way. Um, in addition to the daytime center, they have an interim housing location where they have 50 beds of interim housing which is a little bit different from the traditional shelter model and that women can come to IH and stay pretty much for as long as they need until they can find a different situation. Some of the women are working, some of the women are in school, um, but they have a bed where they can be until they find another situation. And finally, um, Sarah Circle does provide permanent supported housing. So there are 30 units Throughout the community and um, actually within Sarah Circle's uh, buildings, where these are women who experience chronic homelessness based on, um, you know, longstanding complications, whether it's mental health problems, substance abuse, um, for whatever reason, they are chronically homeless. And Sarah Circle provides them a place to be and then provides them with the services and the support that they need to stay um, in the housing. So it's really just a fantastic organization, and it's a lot of women supporting women. Last year, Sir Circle served 793 women in the city from every zip code in the city. So it's not just a north side thing. It's women throughout the city. Um, and they transitioned over 100 women into permanent housing. So it's a organization that really has some amazing successes, and it's built with you know, a lot of love and care and um, it's doing great work and I'm really proud to be part of it. And how did you get involved in it? I literally pass by their daytime center, you know, a hundred times a week. It's just right down the street and it's a really neat building. And I always wondered what it was and did a little research. Um, I did a little fund fundraising drive among some friends last year and just thought it was such a great place. I wanted to get involved and I love that they're doing work in the community and 
helping women um, who otherwise may not get the help. And Devin was a great fundraising team leader, I should mention. She roped me into helping fundraise. <laughs> I should mention that Kelly was an excellent, excellent uh, team member who helped do the fundraising. Beyond excellent. Thank you. That's awesome. Fundraising is often the trickiest thing. So, Well, you know, they have a good model. They have a walk. Uh, and so they have teams that raise money through this walk. And you can, you know, it's the kind of thing where you're getting people to give, sort of sponsor you on your walk, give donations. But the team model really helps everyone sort of be encouraged. So that was really cool. And, you know, I got to give my craftivism plug again that one of the ways that I raised money was to offer people pussy hats if they donated money. It was brilliant. I even got strangers, total strangers to donate. (laughs) Everybody loves the pussy hat. I guess. (laughs) So this question, it was originally for Devin, but I think we can also bring Jamie in here. Recently, in the past decade, um, a lot of cities have been trying to pass laws criminalizing homelessness or making it harder for homeless people to find shelter. And in some cases, they've been uh, making it illegal to feed homeless people. How is this an effective strategy to fight homelessness? And if not, what are some better ways that we can do that? Well, I mean, I think it's probably the most ineffective strategy I could ev- even come up with. You know. People experiencing homelessness, I mean, that's an easy target. And shame on those cities for using their resources basically to punish and, like, assault a community of people who, by their very nature, already are experiencing hardships. Um, It makes no sense to me to spend, um, and I mean, like, literally spend with government and taxpayer dollars, money, time, resources, uh, to basically criminalize homelessness when those funds and all that attention could be used to create like positive change for that same population. You know, you put a, peri- uh, a person experiencing homelessness in jail and, and we're still spending to support them, but not in a way that can make any positive change. Um, so I say spend the money on increasing the services, providing the affordable housing, opportunities for employment, to help people transition uh, from homelessness. And I think what I want to mention, I I did my little research, you know, luckily Chicago does not criminalize it in that way. Um, But I did discover there are some states, uh, Virginia and Connecticut, who've put into place some programs that have helped veterans, um, help end veteran homelessness, basically, by providing permanent housing. And those, to me, seem to be the solutions that work. Um, you know, you give someone a home first and a place to live, and then you can start to address the multitude of issues of why that person was experiencing homelessness in the first place. You can't have one without the other. So Yeah, that's uh, true. And actually, we have a really interesting program in Madison where we have been giving tiny houses um, to homeless people. I don't know if you've, like, heard about the tiny house movement, but it's all what HGTV is talking about these days. <laughs> <laughs> and they had a whole program where they gave tiny houses to homeless people. Um, yeah. I think they were free. Wow. Uh, yeah. I um I would just second what Devin said. I think criminalizing homelessness is the worst solution for for solving the problem. Um, I would say of, of all of the patrons who come to the kitchen that I cook in, uh around two thirds of them are housing insecure and probably a third of them are homeless. Um, So that's a third homeless, a third housing insecure, two thirds of them have insecurity in their home situation. Uh, And I think I see all of those people and I think to myself, we need more to support them. We need, we need definitely to put the money that and resources and, and, physical efforts of people into creating resources that help people who have housing insecurity, for instance, um, have some more secure to live. 